Hi, everyone, and welcome to the MLOps podcast. I am Dean, your host, and today I have with me Jinan Setpal. Jinan is a machine learning engineer at DAGS Hub, where he builds cutting-edge uh, ML research and engineering projects. His recent focus has been on applying large language models and real-world applications, which is a lot of what we're going to be discussing today. And he's also uh, studying data science at Purdue University in the United States. Uh, and he's one of the semifinalists in the Alexa Prize Challenge, which is a pretty prestigious uh, machine learning oriented uh, challenge uh, by Amazon, of course. And so, Jinan, uh, thank you for joining me today. I'm really excited to have you on. It's super excited to be here, Dean. Thank you for having me. Awesome. So let's uh, dive into it. Um, when you first heard about large language models as a, as a concept, and then when ChatGPT was launched, which is at least in my mind, the moment when it all became sort of less theoretical and more of a reality for everyone, how, how did you think about this? Like, what was your first impression? Well, so language models in general have been around for like quite some time, right? Much, much before LLMs came around like ChatGPT. So I guess I had a vague sort of idea of what to expect. And my initial sort of uh, introduction to ChatGPT was so people on social media posting screenshots of it and doing some very, very awesome stuff. And uh, this, I think ChatGPT was released like right after the, the DALI and the image generation hype slowed down, right? With the uh, mid journey and stable diffusion. So the the utility to me was almost instant because uh, being a college student right the ability to solve monotonous undergrad homework is uh is takes a second to notice uh so i i knew this was going to be maybe way bigger the second i i saw it simply because of that it provides uh, something that is more utilitarian depending on on what side of the the uh education spectrum you are on and uh just generally also it is very intelligent it demonstrates some emergent behaviors so yeah uh i i was pretty excited for it the only thing was i wasn't happy it was a uh, closed source so i i swore to not use it until a uh, stable L, uh, llm came out and that's that ended up being uh llama so yeah it was pretty good Llama is definitely uh, another turning point, I guess, for not just having this as closed source. I agree. I guess my my impression was I was in the in the valley at the time. I think it was a week after ChatGPT came out, and it was very um, very noticeable that every conversation either started with or ended with "What do you think about uh, ChatGPT?" And I think that everyone understood. I'm not sure everyone understood it in the same way, but I think everyone understood that there was like. Uh, this is like a watershed moment, like there's a shift uh, and the world of ML is not going to be the same as it was a day before. Um, but I think at the beginning, there was a lot of fog of war aside from ChatGPT itself. What are the applications for this going to look like? So it's very convenient as sort of a replacement for uh, someone to converse with and, and sort of maybe get information out of like sort of an alternative for search engines. Um, but it took a while until other applications of this, I think, uh, became clear to the industry and to the market. Um, and so one of the things that we want to dive into today is one of those applications that I think we're seeing uh, more broadly defined as sort of a chat for X. Uh, so making more knowledge available through a chat interface. and. So the project that you worked on, uh, we called, uh, or you called uh, DPT, which is the, uh, I guess, DAGs of pre-trained transformer, if you take the regular acronym. Uh, but the but can you walk us uh, through what it is and, and how does it uh, use LLMs? Yeah. Uh, so DPT is DAGs Hub's documentation chatbot. And it uh, effectively is a wrapper around OpenAI's ChatGPT 3.5 Turbo with the 16,000 16, token context. Uh, what it effectively does is it leverages a vector database. In this case, we're using ChromaDB to perform a semantic search on all of uh, Dags Hub's documentation. Then uh, on the basis of the responses that it gets, it feeds that with a prompt 
to uh, the ChatGPT API, and the ChatGPT API returns a response back to the user. So it ends up using uh, some general information about things like uh, Git that it already knows, uh, and some information about networking, depending on the topic of the query that is presented by the user. And uh, in addition, it uses a DAG subs, a very specific documentation in context in order to present uh, a response that always sounds perfect, but only mostly is uh, accurate. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to be talking about uh, hallucinations probably a lot later in this conversation, but hopefully uh, for the people at home, this clarifies what the general structure of these things are. And I think one term uh, that I've uh, heard used more often recently for this is uh, RAG or retrieval augmented generation. And so this is sort of a, a kind of a standard architecture at this point where you use a vector DB as Janine described, that sort of gets the documents or the parts of documents that are relevant for the response. And then an LLM uses those uh, documents or document pieces to phrase a response in, in natural language. Um, so I think for me, it was surprising. I, I don't know, maybe I had too low expectations, but I remember the first time we tried it out and yeah, there are hallucinations and challenges and things to improve. Um, but it was surprising how uh, adaptable it is. Like it's, it doesn't seem like uh, generic uh, chat GPT uh, that is getting like documents shoved in the end, but it's actually uh, phrasing answers as if this was always part of the training data set which is really interesting. Um, but I guess from your perspective as a person who built this, like what are some of the more counterintuitive things that you had to deal with uh, um, when working with, I guess, an LLM-based project versus other ML models that you've built in the past? Honestly, I think that's exactly it. Like you hit the spot exactly when you spoke about the fact that it is able to perform uh, downstream tasks so effectively without us fine tuning an additional model on top of it, right? So the general sort of framework for a machine learning model is it, it you define a very narrow task that is algorithmically very hard to define. So humans would find it very difficult to set up an algorithm that that, that performs that exact task sequentially, and you give it a bunch of generally a bunch of supervised data and it is able to find that algorithm uh, parametrically right and uh, the general assumption that i had going into this with zero uh, sort of llm background was that this did that kind of behavior is what i expected so i assumed that fine tuning was 100% going to be part of the process when uh, when i had to eventually develop the bot however the emergent behaviors that uh, LLMs in general define in, in the sense that they are much more general than other language models or than other machine learning models was something that surprised me a lot, right? The fact that we are able to get something that looks very, uh, very, very uh, fine-tuned without actually fine-tuning it is uh, incredible to me. So that is something that I think is really, really awesome. Yeah, um, I agree. I think that the, the there's basically, because of this emergent behavior and the ability to generalize, um, uh, especially in the context, because, because of this is sort of natural language, this is how humans communicate with each other. It means that there's sort of a built-in generalization, assuming you can do a chat interface for some information, like in the case of DPT, uh, the DAGs have uh, uh, documentation and uh, and API and all those things, you effectively create a new layer of customization. I had a conversation earlier today about this, that in regular models, you basically, you can you can train a model from scratch, right? Let, but let's put that aside for a moment. You you can then take a, a pre-trained model and fine tune it. Um, but with, uh, and, and then with LLMs, you basically added two different types of, ca of customization. One is much simpler, which is just prompt engineering. So how do we modify the instruction that we give the model to get a better result? And then on the other side of the spectrum, you have RLHF, which is a much more involved process uh, involving uh, reinforcement learning to Im improve this model. I don't know if you want to maybe expand a bit on how you think about utilizing each one of these processes uh, in, in real LLM applications today. 
Yeah, so both of them are uh, analogously similar, I would say. So they're not exactly the same process. Both work in very, very different ways. However, the or the resultant behavior from performing both of these both of those processes is quite similar. So we have prompt engineering on one end, where you basically give your large language model an instruction set, and it understands that instruction set to a certain numerical extent, and from there, it is able to establish some additional context and use that context to give an output that makes sense. Fine tuning on the other end is uh, changing the actual objective function of the large language model to some to something that is task specific. This is more in tune with the natural or the narrow definition of machine learning that we use normally, where we perform what is essentially domain adaptation. We take your large language model from being generally applicable to being applicable to your domain specifically. And the, the relevance for both of them are also very, very different, right? So one question that you may have is I have both of these approaches, I have uh, RLHF or, or, pre, uh, or fine tuning, and I have prompt engineering. Prompt engineering seems fairly straightforward if I were to look at it. However, it is not super deterministic, while uh, RLHF, depending on the base model that you choose, could be very expensive. So uh, a general guideline for when to use what uh, is A, your budget, uh, and B, uh, it is the domain of the challenge that you are trying to tackle, right? The general objective function of a large language model or, or the thing that it is trained to actually fundamentally solve is the English language, right? We give it a huge corpus of text data and basically try to tell it to identify what would come in it as uh, ahead of the sequence given a particular input, right? Mm -hmm. And it is completely statistic and probabilistic in nature in the sense that it doesn't understand any of the words. And if you were to replace, like if control F and control R a single word across your entire corpus, it would basically assume that the word has completely changed and mm -hmm. it will be completely fine with that, right? Uh, it doesn't break down the word for stuff like its pronunciation or uh, maybe it's some information that it has been derived on in order to get that uh, or in order to infer the meaning of a word, right? So if I say uh, this is familiar to me, and uh, you, uh, if you do not know what unfamiliar means, but you understand that un is generally something that reverses uh, the definition of a word, right? A language model will use that. Uh, a language model will be un will be effectively unable to use that information unless it is specifically encoded, right? And th that is kind of the 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 thing that it would trip itself up on. Anyways, I digress from that. My main point with regards to domain adaptation was if the grammar that you are using during inference time is different from that that is used during your training time, uh, you more generally have to use RLHF in order to get results that do not uh, hallucinate left, right, and center. So that is the, the primary difference. Interesting. So if I try to repeat what you've said to make sure that I understand, you're basically saying that the main decision criteria, putting aside resources, which is obviously an important decision criteria, uh, the main decision criteria of whether or not to go with prompt engineering, which is the simpler approach versus fine tuning, is whether or not the uh, sort of production domain is something that you can train for or not. And if you don't know what to expect in production, you don't know if it's similar, then fine tuning would work not as well is that correct and uh and if you feel like it's going to be similar and you have sort of a training corpus that you can fine tune on and that's going to uh, uh prime the model for the language it expects to get in production then fine tuning in rlhf is more relevant is that correct uh yeah and one i, I guess easy sort of analogy that you can use from the computer vision domain is uh, say you have a pre-trained resnet model the ResNet model can probably identify a vehicle pretty easily, but it cannot identify a specific species of insect, mm -hmm. right? So if you have just a pre-trained model and you want to identify a vehicle, maybe the base ResNet will work pretty much perfectly for you out of the box. 
Yeah. But if you need to identify insects, you need to do that. You need to specifically add some training data of insects and train it on there. And that's kind of the main difference that exists. And uh, the general range of things that come in domain is much more higher in large language models than it does for a computer vision challenge, which is why prompt engineering has become just so popular. Yeah. So I think that the other uh, point about resources is just that it's very easy to do prompt engineering. So I think if you don't know where uh, you fall on this line of the data that you have available and how your uh, a sort of uh, data distribution is going to look like, you might as well start with prompt engineering and see whether or not you can get uh, performance gains that are and get to a place that is reasonable from your perspective before diving into the more complicated um, things. So I, I guess that given that, um, obviously we uh, j just, I guess, I don't know if you said this earlier, but uh, just so people know, the, the DPT is actually a bot that's now connected to our Discord channel. Uh, and so if you go to Dagsev's Discord channel and you ask a question on the support channel, uh, the bot will probably be the first one to answer you. And so this is something that we, even though we knew that it's going to be imperfect and we'll want to improve it, that's fine. We wanted to get it to production as fast as possible. So. Um, I'm curious if you can share with the audience, how did the deployment process uh, uh, look like and how does it change in the case of LLMs, again, compared to regular models? Um, what are some, if you can share some of the challenges that you had uh, during this deployment process? Right. So um, large language models fundamentally are not different from a uh, regular or different deep learning model that has a ton of parameters. Right, uh, architectures are still for feed forward. We go from point A to point B, or like A being our input and B being the output. So uh, in terms of just hosting a language model, I would not imagine that a lot would change, right? But the biggest difference has sort of occurred because of so many people being involved within the large language model space and the just, just the general interest within it. So the biggest one is, has to be uh, open ai and their cloud hosted uh, neural networks so uh, it is it was i think sagemaker was the only service that allowed or the only major service uh, that allowed something like this where you just give it a set of data you can fine tune it uh, you can create a fine tuned model and then host the fine tuned model or it will host the fine tuned model for you and you just ping it like an api Right, mm -hmm. OpenAI uh, did did not do it first, but they did it better. They made the process very very straightforward, and uh, uh, their documentation generally is fantastic. So that is kind of the the paradigm shift that I went through when I was developing DPT, because the main task that I had in hand was uh, setting up the prompt itself which was uh, taken care of through the Brilliant Buster project, which is an open source documentation chatbot uh, that I adapted and updated for DPT. And the, that's the, the, their prompt is basically the, the thing that uh, we found very, very relevant or very, very useful. Uh, we set up that prompt and uh, then with along with the vector database, were able to set up a deployment. Our main sort of deployment itself was the EC2 hosted instance that manages the Discord bot, uh, performs semantic search with the vector database and sends the query over to the uh, over to OpenAI. And we forward that OpenAI's response along with a couple of headers and footers, headers being hi, uh, my name is DPT, and the footer being the sources that we used in order to uh, get or supplement uh, OpenAI or chat GPT-3, uh, GPT-3.5. Amazing. Um, the So if, if I understand correctly, what you're saying is basically the main difference is that you're not at least in the case of DPT, right? We weren't deploying our own hosted LLM. We might do this in the future, uh, but we were using uh, Open, OpenAI's uh, API, which uh, is convenient. Uh, people underestimate the value of good documentation. And I agree with you from what I've seen, OpenAI has really good documentation. You, you, sh like, you shouldn't take it for granted. Uh, it's very important when it's done well. Um, but then you're saying basically the wrapper, which uses uh, ChromaDB to retrieve uh, the documents and all of those, 
that's sort of hosted on a regular service, which uses uh, the OpenAI API. Um, from your experience working with other self-hosted um, uh, LLMs, do you do you think that there's going to be something fundamentally different uh, when we do try out DPT with uh, self-hosted LLMs, or do you feel it's going to be just like as you said, an ML model but bigger? Oh, it it I think it is going to be more uh, an ML model but bigger. We will obviously have to do a lot of uh, or or at least a certain extent of uh, on-prem optimization. So we have to manage our cloud infrastructure. We have to be a, a lot more uh, sort of concerned about the latency of the model because just the time for influence cannot be very very huge. Uh, the one. The thing that I had included in the Discord bot itself that I found very helpful was the fact that we had uh, uh, the the thinking emoji like this uh, when the bot is actually thinking, right? And this is a sort of base, uh, like a, a, a UX thing where uh, if the user believes that the thing that they are interacting with is frozen, they will have zero patience and they will immediately disconnect. Right, and this applies to anything with uh, with any degree of latency, which is why that refreshing thing is uh the, is is so important to any sort of UX. So one very very basic change that I made was whenever the user makes a query, it adds the thinking emoji until it is able to figure out the answer, and then it posts the answer uh once it has that ready, and that also sort of helps the 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 general the general UX. Uh, anyways, for your on prem uh for an on-prem installation, something that is very important to consider generally is your latency. Uh, we have things like quantization that have helped with that. So experimenting with a quantization aware training approach wherein we have uh, a machine learning model that can not only perform inference with the highest bit accuracy or like highest, uh, highest bit, uh, yeah, high, highest bit accuracy, but also something with, with the, uh, of when you have fewer bits to play with. So that is something that is important and something that we have to consider on top of generally just hosting a large, uh, large parameterized model. Yeah, so I think those are two really great points. The first is, uh, to me, uh, we, we started by talking about the launch of uh, ChatGPT. I think that obviously OpenAI did a lot of smart things uh, with respect to their model uh, and build, building process. Uh, but the thing that I think that they did the smartest is actually the UX. Um, like the interaction with a chatbot to unlock all of those capabilities is in hindsight, uh, very intuitive, but evidently that wasn't really done well before. And so I think that the a point you made about the thinking emoji, like you need to map the behavior of these models, which are sometimes very large and maybe slower than we'd want to what the user would expect to see. Similar to when you talk to people in whatever chat uh, application you like, uh, you usually see that someone is typing. And this is what OpenAI did with the ChatGPT interface as well. And I think that's very powerful because you know that something is happening and you're not just uh, you're not just stuck. Uh, the, the other thing about uh, uh, quantization and optimizing uh, infrastructure, I think that the, this also relates to the UX. Uh, and I think we've discussed this in, in different contexts in the past, but if you have... Uh, real-time ML application, which a chatbot effectively is always, it's always real-time because someone is chatting with it. Um, it might be the case that beyond a certain scale, you want to have actually two models. One is the simpler model that handles sort of the quick response, and the other is the bigger, more sophisticated model, which can handle the harder question but takes more time. And you can sort of route to which model makes sense, which according to rumors is what OpenAI does with uh, GPT-4 as well. It's not one model, it's multiple models and they're experts at different tasks. And then you get routed to the relevant uh, part of the model if you want to think about it this way, uh, depending on your need. So I think that this is very important with respect to UX and you can get much better results without actually needing to make significantly bigger models or use significantly more resources. Um, so with that, I think we can't talk about LLMs and LLM ops without talking about uh, hallucination. So before we dive into that, how do we know if the model is performing well? How do you think about evaluating large language models? Well, I mean, I guess the short answer is more like it depends. 
because uh, uh, everything is very, very task dependent, right? We have uh, the, if you want to talk about, you know, training the foundational model, so something that can just understand the task corpus very well, uh, that would take it just a general supervised approach. And uh, the you would use factors like blue uh, for actually evaluating, actually evaluating the performance of the language model. Uh, for tasks like sentence summarization or just anything that is sequence to sequence, right? Which is, I guess, the main focus of uh, what we will be talking about. Uh, Blue is also very, very relevant for that. And besides that, for more downstream tasks, uh, we often see more human evaluators that are uh, at the forefront of this because a lot of tasks require the fact that you uh, like require some nuance that cannot be automated very easily. So while uh, rudimentary uh, methods are definitely used to, to sort of set up metrics for models, even just accuracy uh, is a big one. Uh, the main sort of evaluation comes from humans themselves. So that is the, the reason why RLHF is so super popular and common, simply because the versatilities that humans have when it comes to evaluating these things is much greater than that of something that we can automate. And uh, that is also why I think the, there was the MIT paper that used ChatGPT to automate the evaluation of itself. Uh, and that didn't work for completely different reasons. Uh, but uh, the, their intuition, I think, was just that, that if a ChatGPT is representative to a human, then it can possibly automate the evaluation of tasks that human evaluators previously or human annotators previously worked on. Yeah, I think we're we're seeing a lot of, or at least I'm hearing of it. I actually am not sure I've seen one uh, something like this in production, uh, but at least I'm hearing about a lot of uh, uh, companies and ML teams that are trying to use GPT, whether it's GPT-4 or ChatGPT for uh, evaluating uh, or annotating NLP tasks. I think it definitely works to a certain extent, uh, as you say, uh, knowing to what extent exactly is uh, is a challenge in and of itself. But I think that the main point to me, which is is the point that you made, like there are a lot of metrics that sound nice on paper and you could use for classic NLP tasks. You could theoretically use them for LLMs, but you're probably not going to get the result that you want because many of those metrics assume that the task is like token prediction and trying to predict the next word. Um, but that's not actually what we want from a model like ChatGPT or DPT. We want it to provide useful information in a way that makes sense to the user and and, and is helpful. Um, and so unfortunately, or, or I don't know if this is unfortunate, but this is sort of the, the reality of, of uh, the situation is that you usually need a person involved in that process. And so um, it, it sort of takes the shape of something that looks a bit more like data annotation, uh, but you're actually asking people yep. to tell whether or not a certain result is is better or worse, and then you use their uh, ratings to calculate the um, the metric that you actually care about and decide whether something is is uh, doing well or not. You, you want to add anything? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's kind of absolutely it, right? Uh, with LNMs in general, it's kind of why uh, having an active learning pipeline for these is so important because you want to set up a training process that is much more dynamic, right? Language itself evolves over time very, very rapidly depending on the formality of the setting that you're uh, performing your inference in. But um, even things like the API for our documentation model, it continuously evolves and we have to sort of stay on top of that. And uh, having a, a, an active learning pipeline enables that because it's a lot of back and forth between sort of training a model, getting the fine-tuned model, getting annotations, human evaluators identifying which one, uh, which annotations are best and which are worse, and then reverting that and sort of fixing it in the next step along the way. And then slowly that cycle continues for it to get better. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So I, I think uh, this is a really important point, which is that some cases in the past, you could have said, my data is pretty much static, right? Like I'm just going to train on a data set and uh, play with the model architecture and I'll be fine. Uh, I think with language and chat, it's very clear that it's not going to be the case and your data is going to evolve 
and you need to understand if it changes fundamentally uh, uh, so that you can update your model. Um, and I think this leads us to the uh, fun part. So uh, to share, I think a few people shared this online, so it's no secret, but uh, I was uh, in a in an event with uh, both uh, Sam Altman and Ilya Satskever, and uh, uh, which are Sam is the CEO and Ilya is, uh, I think, the, I, I don't know if he's a CTO or a CSO of OpenAI, uh, but they claim that um, hallucinations are going to be a solved problem. Uh, I think they're really smart and they might be right, but so far, unfortunately, that's not the case. And so how do you think about uh, sort of uh, combating hallucinations in LLMs? Uh, what are the best techniques that you've seen uh, to do this? Right. So uh, hallucinations generally, as of now, at least are an open problem, right? We, uh, the, the general or the, the explicit objective function, as we previously discussed of a language model is to not, is not to, to master the downstream task, but to master the problem. Its objective is uh, not the problem, the language, sorry. Mm -hmm. So its objective is not to be the most helpful documentation chatbot. Its objective is to successfully the user into believing that what it says makes sense right that's the that's that is the explicit objective function and the this sort of creates incentives that are misaligned between the actual language model and what we wanted to do the misalignment of the fun, uh, of the uh, the misalignment of the incentives is what allows for it to be so general but also is what enables the fact that it, uh, or enables it to be prone to these hallucinations and uh, that is sort of ties back to the 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 uh, challenge that I mentioned earlier with the, the domain adaptation, right? So the further your domain is, the more likely it is to hallucinate. And that currently is uh, uh, kind of the the most active or the best metric that we have to identify uh, the likelihood of your model hallucinating given the situation. And uh, Currently, there are a couple of uh, general approaches that are taken. One interesting one that I read about recently was uh, using, um, okay, let me see if I can recall what the title of the paper was. Uh, I think, uh, okay, I'm, I don't, I, I'm failing to recall, but the, the general idea behind that paper was uh, it ensured that low confidence gen, uh, generations were actually representative of uh, queries or responses that were more likely to hallucinate. Mm -hmm. So the general thing behind hallucination is it provides an output and that output it is 100% confident about and the output is 100% wrong, right? And the, the uh, the general idea is that this, this is obviously a problem and it is not really restricted to large language models. Large language models just exaggerate that problem to an extent that makes it, you know, a significant research area. Mm -hmm. And uh, the this was solved partially by Bayesian neural networks where they used Bayesian, uh, I think, uh, uh, some Hamiltonian uh, fine tuning in order to obtain a Bayesian model that is effectively an ensemble of models mm. that uh, has the confidence more uh, representative of the actual accuracy. So if a prediction, it is if it is not sure about a prediction, it is much more likely to have a lower confidence than, uh, than a, a regular model, which can have very high confidence for a prediction that is inaccurate. So that was an interesting approach that I uh, saw that allows you to patch hallucinations to a certain extent. I can probably share the paper in the LinkedIn chat or something later on. Uh, but the uh, more straightforward approach to fixing it is solving the the is solving the uh, the domain adaptation, right? Solving the difference between the target domain and the in, uh, and the training domain. So you can do this by uh, a adding more data, adding better data. So that is the most linear way of approaching this. And the active learning pipeline also helps a lot because you run multiple passes on uh, additional training data that keeps coming in, and it allows you to expand. Uh, the definition of, uh, of your language model so that it is much more accurate or it, it encapsulate a, a much wider set of use cases mm -hmm. and that way it's able to be a lot more accurate and hallucinate a lot less generally 
you can also reduce the temperature of your uh, inference, in which case uh, the responses will be more uh, like a search engine where you just take out the text that is relevant and it just prints that out for you. Uh, and uh, in, in a in a more natural language setting, of course, so it's not as creative, but it is a lot more accurate. That is one way to go about this. Uh, to go about this, uh, OpenAI's documentation also talks about that uh, quite extensively, which is awesome. Uh, and uh, besides that, just fine tuning. So RLH stuff that we discussed earlier is, is a fantastic way to perform domain adaptation and prevent you yourself from having a model that hallucinates frequently. So one uh, small question I have about this is uh, if you're implement, if someone in the audience, like you're definitely doing this, but if someone in the audience is implementing something like uh, DPT, where you provide a list of documents and things like that, have you seen from your experience or read in papers uh, that maybe chopping up the documents in different ways should affect hallucination? Or is that more or less like set depending on the content and it doesn't really matter how you present it to the model? Are you looking for the chats now? No, no, no. I'm I'm asking you uh, if there is a, a oh. if, if like changing the the document uh, structure, if, if chopping up the documents differently, you think uh, could help battle hallucinations, or it doesn't really affect it because oh. the model has access to the same data. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yes, because uh, so one important thing to note is also the context of these large language models. Uh, so currently we're using three point uh, GPT three point five with the sixteen k context, right? So the the normal default context is four thousand tokens, and we're using the one with sixteen thousand tokens. The context size is especially relevant simply because it allows us to add just that much more information into our uh, into our model, right? Or into our into our prompt, and that prompt is what is understood by ChatGPT, and it gives us a response that is relevant, hopefully relevant. So. Uh, breaking up our document into sections, so maybe uh, with uh, by header, allows us to increase or improve the fine grained uh, nature of our information. This is especially relevant for stuff like our troubleshooting pages, where mm -hmm. you may have one tiny troubleshooting query and the solution may be a one liner, but in order for that to be included within the documentation, uh, the first the embedding has to be expressive enough to ensure that it identifies that tiny section and uh, accurately sort of returns that as part of the uh, as part of your context mm -hmm. and the context window should be large enough. So if I have a huge troubleshooting page, right, and this ex exceeds my context window, I could I accurately identify the fact that the answer exists within the troubleshooting page, but it, it, it may just not fit within the window and it will basically get cropped out. As a result of that, the, the answer will not exist within the input and then the model is confused. So it ends up being forced to hallucinate if the training data does not already have the answer that it's requesting, which is very likely given uh, the ever evolving nature of our documentation and our API. So uh, it definitely helps and it's very, very relevant if it is possible to get the same set of information, like it had the information that is required to answer the question in a smaller context window, that also helps a lot because that means that it is less information for the large language model to look through in order to identify the parts of the input that is actually relevant. So, yeah. So I think that's a great, uh, it's a great point. And I think that uh, just to uh, put a, a bit of uh, sort of uh, dive into one nuance of what you said. It might be the case that if you don't uh, chop up your uh, documents well, then you might be setting your model up to fail because it finds the right document, but because it's much longer than the context, it knows that this is the right document, so it expects the answer to be there, but you're chopping out the answer. And so the model can't find it, so it sort of is forced to hallucinate. So it might be the case that you could get a lot of gains out of uh, making the uh, sort of uh, this, this chunk that you use as a document smaller. Uh, so this is just uh, one last point. So before we open it up to questions from the audience, uh, the last question I have for you is um, if you have any recommendations for anyone here listening live or anyone that's going to see this episode later, uh, it doesn't have to be data science or LLM uh, related. But uh, uh, maybe content that you recommend reading, papers, Netflix shows, whatever you want, and then we'll open it up to questions for the audience from the audience. 
Mm. If, it, if it doesn't have to be a, a data science related, stay hydrated. That is uh, important. Uh, but uh, you already knew that probably. Uh, something that I really want to talk about though is, is just interpretability in research. So one of the reasons that hallucinations are so hard to detect is the fact that uh, you said it doesn't have to be data science, but I'm making this data science anyways. Um, <laughs> uh, is is the one major reason why we don't sort of know the situations of the uh, the cases when LLMs hallucinate and require human annotators to do that for us is the fact that uh, large language models are still very much black box or deep learning generally is still very much black box, right? We have an input that is given, some magic happens in the in between and we have an output on the other end. Now we understand the process behind which that magic happens, but we do not know or we cannot uh, actually understand by reading the parameters what the behavior should be. So we can't predict the behavior of the uh, language model just by knowing the input and having intrinsic interpretability within deep learning models will go a long way towards ensuring the lack of a bias identifying parameters that seem optimal but uh, yet aren't so a lot of uh, stuff like the loss function can perform or can return an optimal loss for a huge set of hyperparameters, uh, a huge set of parameters, and it is very difficult to identify which set of parameters you should pick. I believe that interpretability can help with that uh, to provide a unbiased estimate of what parameters to use, and hopefully it should also promote emergent behaviors. So generally, uh, I implore you guys to all look at uh, intrinsic interpretability just in general within whatever context of uh, uh, deep learning you are looking into. Oh yeah, muted team. The, the perennial problem. How, uh, how many computer scientists does it take to figure out one conferencing application? Three is the answer. I need <laughs> No, it's back down to two again. Oh, I guess he disconnected the audio or something, so it unmuted itself. Oh, no, but he can't hear us. I don't know. Yeah, he can hear us. Unmute yeah. unmute yourself. Uh, Sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah. Technical difficulties. Right? We made it so that it's. Uh, <laughs> I couldn't unmute myself either. Um, yeah. So uh, <laughs> thanks for bearing with us, uh, and uh, let's uh, get into audience uh, questions. So I see that there were a lot of things uh, going back up. I'm going to just uh, scroll back up and go over things in the order that you uh, sent them out. Uh, yeah, the recording will be available. I think I see the near answer. It. So answered this. So um, I see that uh, we have one question, which is how does the speed of generating the output during inference can be increased like in chat GPT? So I'm guessing the context of this question is like, if you're self-hosting a model and you want to improve its performance, um, what do you have any tips for that? Yeah, okay. So the one biggest, biggest tip is definitely quantization, right? Uh, generally, models are evaluated or inferred in, uh, I think, 32 or 64 bit accuracy. And having this high level of, uh, not accuracy, but precision, this high level of precision means uh, that it is, the inference generally is very, very slow because uh, GPUs are very quick at matrix multiplication, but they get much more quicker with the, the, the less of the precision that is used. So uh, it just makes more sense. It's a harder, uh, it's a harder computation to evaluate. So uh, you can improve the speed of uh, your inference by just generally quantizing uh, your models. There is a eight bit quantization that I think is the, the most up to date. Uh, I think NVIDIA was working on 
or is working on four bit quantization, but I'm not up to date on whether or not they actually launched that yet. And uh, if you quantize your models to four bit while CUDA is not up to date with it, so they, they accelerate eight bit computation, that would basically mean that your model would uh, perform slower computation when it is performing four bit inference. So that is something to keep in mind as well. Uh, lesser does not always mean better. You also need to have your uh, actual accelerated compute uh, sort of being there in order to, or supporting the quantization that you're looking to get. Um, in addition, there are also specialized hardware that you, if you can get your access on is, is really, really relevant or really helpful to accelerating inference. Uh, there are new architectures that are being developed that instead of taking scalar inputs, take, make, uh, take vector inputs and uh, matrix inputs. And uh, that, makes computations so much more faster uh, simply because it is effectively embedding things like a loss function into a, an instruction set of the CPU or the processing unit, whatever the, uh, the developer likes to call it. So if you can get your hands on uh, additional TPU-related accelerated compute, definitely that is the way to go. And uh, besides that, one thing we touched upon earlier was uh, using uh, ensemble models and maybe using a smaller model if you are able to identify the uh, user query being something that can be resolved by something that is uh, much more simpler than what you actually have on hand. Yeah. Um, so those are all amazing tips. Um, I think that the uh, if you've ever used the chatbot in the old world of before LLMs, when you're trying to get to an actual uh, like human uh, uh, sort of, uh, let's say, support person, uh, then they always have like these annoying if-elses that you need to go through before you can actually talk to a human. You might want to keep that even if we're not having a human in the end, but a chatbot uh, to screen through the simple questions and things like that. Not that I'm advocating for that user experience because we all know it's horrible. Um, I see that Alex asked uh, the name of the open source uh, bot again. So I shared the link to DPT, which is the project that uh, uh, Jinen uh, is working on. In the bottom of the chat, you can look at it now. Uh, the question after that is, is it possible that different evaluators have different opinions or biases? Can you give an example of a situation like that and how you resolve it? Yeah, that is an awesome point. So uh, this was actually part of a, a lot of the papers that I read about evaluations. So it, it's kind of funny, actually, a lot of papers that are here today are mostly survey papers that look over all of or accumulate all of the awesome information that has been put out either through private or public domains and sort of analyze that very, very carefully. And the general opinion that I got from this was that it is accepted that human annotators are going to be a lot more variable uh, than something that is automated or computed like an algorithm. And th this variance, while not ideal, is generally okay. The uh, annotators are given a set of rules that they should generally follow and are um, in most cases, uh, and in most cases provide uh, comments regarding explanations for why they gave a certain decision to or a certain rating to a certain output. And uh, those are some of the ways where the variance is mitigated as much as possible. But the general assumption is that uh, if you take a random sample of annotators, their variances effectively average out and it is not that much of a problem. However, I definitely disagree simply because if you are sourcing all of the annotators for a certain region, I don't think that is a, a random sample of data. And the, definitely a lot of models have been shown to have biases and that has been in part due to these training strategies uh, with, a, with a bias that is embedded in it. Yeah, I think that in general at this point when we're when people are no longer shy about calling these things uh, AI and not just machine learning, um, we need to we need to recognize that there is uh, because because it's so hard to evaluate these models. We're putting a human in the loop. Um, it means that we're going to uh, affect the results of the models in ways that are uh, harder to predict even than usual. Um, and and part of the I think that part of the idea here is that the task that you give, especially if you're doing something like RLHF where you're asking someone to rank results sort of limits the effect that they have 
on the evaluation. So I'm, I'm not sure if this was built as a plan to reduce bias, but you could argue that it's better than giving like a longer answer that maybe has more opportunity to introduce bias because you're basically getting like three answers and being asked to rank them. So you're limited in, in the effect that you have. But yeah, I think I agree with uh, with everything uh, Janen said. It, it, uh, it's a good it's a good point. Um, I think uh, Guy, I hope I'm pre presenting his name uh, correctly, says that he disagrees with the comment that setting temperature to zero will reduce hallucinations. The more the model will still give a wrong answer, but more consistent. I think uh, Janen, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the point is not that the model will be more correct, but that it's going to be more consistent, so it's easier to try to fix the the problem as opposed to if it's uh, yeah absolutely exactly that's that's uh precisely it so if i give uh the the language model a, a context and i give it i expect it to answer i expect it to provide it like a, I, if i give a language model a query and some context but the answer to the uh, query is not present in the context or the source training data there is nothing the model can do right it it has to come up with an answer so uh reducing the temperature would just make it a lot more consistent in in that sense uh however it is not a solution to the problem uh definitely hallucination is, is an open problem at this stage we don't have a, a consistent solution just a monkey patch uh, not monkey patch what is it called uh stop gap solutions that kind of mitigate the problem but not really yeah yeah um and then uh, guru is asking uh is it computationally expensive to adjust the already the pre-trained model from human annotations? Uh, I don't know if if OpenAI shared how expensive it was to turn like to fine tune GPT into ChatGPT. Uh, I think that the answer is if you're doing RLHF. This is my answer, Gina. You can add afterwards, but but like if you're doing RLHF, it's at least going to be expensive in the sense that you need someone to provide uh, the the ranked results. So uh, you're going to need to have a fleet of annotators. I think OpenAI, uh, we're using like thousands of annotators. So that's a very large scale. That's not going to be cheap regardless of, uh, of uh, who you are. But I'm guessing you could probably find uh, cheaper ways to do that. Jinan, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yes, two things. So firstly, we have uh, this awesome paper called Lima or uh, less is more for model alignment, right? And th that shows that the amount of annotations that you need is not that high, but the co uh, assuming your, the quality of your annotations is fantastic. Mm -hmm. So they used uh, some amount of data that was generated by uh, ChatGPT and they manually filtered out the best performing data from there and added additional uh, synthetic uh, data from things like, uh, I think, uh, uh, Reddit subreddits. And uh, the, this data was very carefully annotated. And after the very careful annotation, was uh, pe were people able to uh, train a model that outperformed GPT-4 on a certain set of downstream tasks, mm -hmm. right? Now this is this is a uh, fine tuning, and obviously that that means that it will inherently be better because you are performing that adaptation step. But uh, it still means a lot because it uh, this was uh, Llama, I think, uh, or Alpaca, I'm not sure, uh, and it was able to outperform uh, GPT-4 on the task uh, with a very small set of annotations and a very good amount of very high quality training data. Uh, in addition, just the fine tuning process can also be uh, optimized. There is uh, LoRa and QLoRa, uh, which is a low rank adaptation or Q for quantized low rank adaptation. Uh, I know for a fact that QLoRa can be used to train or to fine tune a 65 billion parameter large language, large language model on a single A100 chip. Uh, that can be very expensive or nothing at all. Uh, this mostly depends on the in the context in which you are working. Uh, but uh, it is a fantastic feat. And I think uh, smaller large language models, it's funny that I have to say that, uh, like 7 billion parameters can be trained on, on smaller uh, NVIDIA chips. So it is it is definitely possible to, to get something done, even if you are a small operation and are trying to fine tune a large language model. Yeah. Um... Those those are really great uh, tips. Thanks for sharing. Uh, 
Hui is asking, I guess we answered the question of how we can increase uh, the performance of non of self-hosted models. Uh, but there's a question here, how can we reduce the latency of the model API for open AI? Uh, I, I feel like for us, uh, we haven't experienced crazy latencies. I've heard other people have. I don't know, uh, Jinan, do you have any insights on how people can accelerate that as well? So we we did actually have a lot of latency. So initially, I uh, experimented with GPT-4 or using GPT-4 uh, as the, the foundational LLM that would actually process the, the prompt that we fed it. And the, the it it was definitely very accurate, but it was slow, and th that kind of sucks. So which that is why I switched to the Turbo family of models. So you can you if you look through OpenAI's models, you will see that the Turbo setup over there on uh, or like Turbo as part of the the string uh, that specifies the model ID, and those are the generally uh, models that have uh, the quicker inference time and lower latency. And GPT 3.5 was generally quite accurate. Uh, so in, not as good as four, of course, but uh, reasonably so. It was a good balance between latency and accuracy, which is why we ended up going with that. Yeah. So I think uh, the basically what, what Jinan is saying, is, this is a trade-off. Like uh, if you want the most accurate model, you're going to pro for now settle for speed. It's probably always going to be the case. Like the best model is going to be slower than smaller models, but uh, but that's one way to get around this. Uh, Benji is asking a hard question um, to predict the future. Uh, prediction is hard, especially especially about the future, but what do you think are going to be future metrics for LLMs, knowing like the limitations of the existing metrics that we have? Any, I don't any think hints? I'm, I don't think I'm qualified to answer this question, really, honestly. <laughs> um, that be the future metrics. So very, uh, very, very hopefully, at least, at least this is the type of research that I'm very interested in. I want uh, metrics and things like loss functions to be based on uh, intrinsic interpretability. Uh, so uh, I did a project in computer vision where I set up an intermediate layer that is generally hidden to actually represent something that is obvious or that is understandable to us uh, with using class activation mappings. But that's probably a topic for another time. And then I use a loss function on that interpretable hidden layer uh, to optimize the domain generalization performance of that computer vision model. I really, really hope that in the future, we use the uh, the nature of uh, attention mechanisms gene being generally uh, more interpretable. So you understand what parts of the, the input are more relevant as far as the model is concerned. Uh, I, I really hope that we use that in order to uh, develop loss functions that leverage the intrinsic interpretability of uh, large language models to get parameters that are uh, optimized and awesome beyond just the, the the optimal threshold that we that we see uh, that is more relevant to things like meta learning yeah so it seems like uh we have another audience member ashay who's uh, thinking like you and he asked if there was a uh, some method for llm similar to grad cam for vision tasks so uh if, if you were to suggest some uh, methods that uh are sort of going to be that are most user popular uh what would they be uh, but I, I think your answer is that they don't yet exist. But if you have anything like that, maybe uh, he'd be interested in hearing. Yeah, uh, someday for sure. I, I I want to answer this question someday, but I don't think today. Uh, I would have something that is that would satisfy uh, satisfy you today, unfortunately. So uh, Mirko is. We're we're going to do another couple of minutes because we started a bit late. Then uh, after four, we'll do another couple of minutes and try to answer all the questions that are still here. Um, Mirko is asking, what are the development stack and tools that uh, you would recommend for someone building an LLM application? Okay. Um... So I, I I would suppose that again depends on if you are going down the fine tuning route or just using prompt engineering. Uh, if you are going with prompt, uh, I I really wish OpenAI would open source their models, but uh, still, uh, they are currently the 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 best solution and for uh, LLMs simply because they have mastered 
scaling uh, large language models, which is, I think, probably the most awesome part of it. They are able to provide large language models in a cost effective way for users or reasonably cost effective way for users. Uh, and it is definitely very commendable. So that would be a large part of your development stack. Uh, besides that, uh, uh, I, I work at DAGSUB, so I will obviously recommend DAGSUB. Uh, we uh, have a lot of open source or integrate a lot of open source tools. Uh, since OpenAI is not open source, we do not integrate OpenAI. Uh, maybe someday, but uh, the uh, we integrate a lot of uh, open source tools and are the the single source of truth for a machine learning project. So it's a very good way to establish uh, like a, a sort of home for your machine learning project instead of having things in a distributed way, like your data being someplace and your code being someplace. So uh, that I recommend very much. Uh, in general, for vector data, vector databases, I don't think you really need to. Uh, the choice does not matter very much. Uh, most are open source, which is good. Uh, I use uh, Chroma DB, but that was mostly because that was the first one I ran into. The performance for most of them will be more or less the same, and the main determining factor is the embedding. Uh, the model that you use to generate the actual embeddings uh, remaining the performance is generally immaterial. I recommend going with something that uses Rust as a backend or Golang because those scale well, uh, but that is about it. Um, besides that, for uh, fine tuning, you would have to have things, uh, you would have to use things like the label studio for data annotation, which is part of tag sub stack uh, that we integrate and um, experiment tracking is very important and data management is also very important so these things are generally something to keep in mind for experiment tracking uh, i recommend mlflow and for general data management uh, we just released the data engine uh, which is something that you should also check out uh, but yeah Awesome. So I think we have two more questions. Uh, one is uh, from Ashay. He's asking, what is the current situation of privacy slash security in LLMs? Uh, or do people just use normal techniques as other simpler deep learning models? And how do you think about dealing with specific problems with generative AI? Sorry, I'm a bit confused. Oh, what do you? Um, no. I see it now. Okay, well, sorry. I generally read it because I cannot hear it. So give me a second. No uh, Current situation of privacy security aspects. People use normal techniques as other simple deep learning. How to deal with issues specifically generated by AI. Um, privacy, privacy, security aspects of large language models uh, is, well, one, I think, a common uh, thing that was uh, popular was asking large language models to reveal uh, API keys at some point, and it did manage to generate some that were successfully used. Uh, but I don't think that's really a problem with uh, LLM specifically, because if you do a similar search on GitHub, honestly, you might probably find a, a bunch of very relevant resources. It's just search engine dynamics at that point. Uh, privacy with respect to uh, open AI, using your data to adversely train the model, that is something that is, I guess, part of the terms and conditions that you agree to when you set up or when you start using uh, chat GPD or any cloud hosted service in general. This is not just limited to open AI. They're just the forerunners of the space um, or the front runners of the space. So um, I think uh, it, privacy generally is very concerning. It is uh, something that should be preserved and is part of the reason I don't use it for personal reasons. But um, I, I guess that is again a trade off that you can choose to make or not make. Um, yeah. I didn't understand the the last uh, like the last sentence of the first paragraph. Do people use the same techniques as other simple deep learning models? Uh, yeah, Dean, if you have any idea, could you help me with that? Yeah, I, I think that in general, uh, just to uh, uh, add something to the point that Janen made. First, uh, OpenAI at least officially says that they're not using uh, chat inputs from ChatGPT for training the model. They sort of made a point of saying that after a bunch of people accused them of doing that. So uh, assuming you trust them, then um, that that's fine. 
Uh, generally speaking, with privacy security, I think that this is part of the reason that uh, Janine is, is talking about sort of the trade-off between self-hosted and open AIs uh, or whatever, any other provider that's anthropic or, or cohere. Um, you, you can't guarantee anything unless you're controlling the model. On the other hand, there are special expertise that the folks at OpenAI have with respect to scaling these models and things like that. So you need to make the trade-off of what you're willing to pay uh, uh, with, whether it's performance or uh, the, the potential security of having something external. Uh, I'm guessing that there's going to be more and more solutions that enable you to do different trade-offs. OpenAI just launched OpenAI Enterprise, and you have the option to use open AI services through Microsoft Azure, uh, which is supposed to have better like enterprise security and things like that. So I think that there is a lot of options on the spectrum. Um, but if you're talking about like techniques for ensuring privacy of data and LLMs and things like that, uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I don't feel very qualified to answer whether there's something specific. I think yeah, everything that applied to regular ML models probably applies here as well. Oh, uh, I think I, uh, I I I kind of get what I just realized. I think you're talking about like when you talk about like uh, privacy preserving techniques that might not work. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there is this uh, one approach, CryptoNets. I think that I looked up that uses uh, homomorphic encryption. That is uh, a private privacy preserving technique. I think that you are talking about uh, most of the privacy preserving techniques. The reason they're not applied very generally is because uh, homomorphic computation is generally it's just super expensive training uh, a model that is privacy pre preserving by nature is extremely hard and the even then there are other uh, privacy preserving techniques not related to things like cryptonet that uh, involve updating the data distribution to remove things like outliers however this means that individuals are generally misrepresented and this increases the bias of the model. So uh, I think privacy pre preserving techniques are not yet really ready for general use, uh, but I could be very, very much wrong. Uh, this is a uh, very uh, opinion territory, but uh, there is that point I, that I think that we are still some distance away from having privacy preserving techniques being uh, industry standard with models. And when you take the cost of computation and like push that scale up to the very edge, like large language models are doing today, it definitely becomes a lot more challenging as well. And is something that we need to contend with, which I think makes it computationally intractable at this point. Mm -hmm. um, thanks for that. And this is going to be the last question. Um, I think there aren't any new questions from the audience anyway, but uh, so, uh, how do we monitor LLMs in production? This is a very big question. So if you have any like tips uh, into how to think about this and, and what we're planning on doing with uh, DPT or have already done, that would be great. Um, there are a lot of really good resources for cloud infrastructure management. I think Terraform uh, is uh, one of them that handles our, uh, infrastructure management really well at scale. Um, generally, when we are looking at hosting things on AWS, there are auto scaling groups uh, as well as uh, things like, um, uh, what is it called? Um, ECR services, uh, no, ECS, ECS uh, services that have the capability of adding monitoring by default. And uh, on top of that, also ensure that um, you are able to uh, sort of set up or reset a, a given instance the minute that it crashes or is no longer functional. Uh, so that is great. You can also set up uh, scaling strategies. So uh, you may want to set a buffer between the amount of available compute and the number of users. So you don't want to be uh, too safe where you have too many models and uh, too many uh, nodes and you're just wasting your GPUs uh, and you don't want to have too less where your users are impacted. So I think AWS suite is generally very, very good for this. And more broadly, I think uh, who, over here, when you're doing stuff that is on-prem or on the cloud, but self-managed, uh, it, it applies more the, the, the idea that just uh, a large language model is a huge model and should not be considered much further. Um, I think it is more or less true and should basically cover most of your use cases when it comes to monitoring a large language model that is hosted on the cloud. 
Yeah, so I'll just add one last thing, which is if you meant this question with respect to what sometimes is called like model monitoring or data drift monitoring, things like that, I think this relates to the earlier question about evaluation techniques. And part of the reason that this is difficult is because we haven't settled on an evaluation technique that is that doesn't involve a human in the loop and is actually indicative of performance. So if you want to do something like uh, you know, notice that there's a data drift in your data, you need to define what a good result from the model is. And that usually involves uh, a sort of um, human in the loop process. So I think that if if you're talking about like infrastructure monitoring for LLMs, I think what Janine answered is the, the full answer. Uh, if you're talking about evaluating and monitoring the performance, then you need to, the, the, the model performance, um, then you need to take into consideration that this is going to be a process that happens sort of uh, semi-manually, where you collect prompts that are coming in from production, um, you collect the model's response, and then you let someone rank them uh, or 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 look at them manually to decide whether or not the model is performing well. So it's not going to be like real-time monitoring. It's going to be something that's a bit more uh, retroactive. Um, so that's, that's it. So uh, with that... Um, I want to uh, thank you, Jinan, uh, for joining me today and uh, answering all of these questions about LLMs and LLM ops. Um, so, yeah, thank you for joining. And thanks for having me. Uh, and yeah, and, and thanks to the audience uh, for joining us as well. This has been our first live episode. If you uh, liked it, then let us know. Uh, maybe uh, add a post on social media so we know that people actually like this, and uh, we'll do more of these. Uh, it was a pleasure having you all. And I think the questions that you, that we got from the audience were awesome questions. Um, so yeah, thank you all for joining and uh, we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you for listening to the MLOps podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please like the video or subscribe. If you have any feedback, leave a comment below. Thanks again for listening and see you next time.